This is part two of the lecture on the final solution. We saw how this genocide was gradually ramped up by the Nazis over a period of years, actually. Uh, the Nazis begin their murder project essentially with Operation T4, the so-called euthanasia projects where they were murdering their own children, uh, disabled uh, Germans. We saw that this systematic murder was eventually passed on to Einsatzgruppen, uh, beginning with the, the invasion of Poland, where the Nazis then systematically murdered uh, millions of uh, Poles in an attempt to just eliminate the population of Poland. Uh, we saw that the Einsatzgruppen were then deployed into Russia uh, on June 22nd, 1941, where an Operation Barbarossa were launched. And just as in Poland, there were these massive executions. But now we began to see that even though ostensibly the purpose of the Einsatzgruppen was pacification of the population and a search for communists, it was very quickly grafted into a murder of uh, Jews as well. At first, Jewish males of military age, and then eventually they will begin murdering uh, women and uh, children as well. All this is occurring before what we know as the final solution was implemented as official Nazi policy. So, we see that approximately 72,000 to 200,000 Germans were murdered in T4 and other so-called euthanasia operations. Um, an estimated 1.8 to 2.77 million non-Jewish ethnic Poles were murdered as well. Uh, and then 1.2 million Jews in Einsatzgruppen shootings and as well in ghetto deprivation, hunger, disease by September of 1941. In other words, 80% um, of the Jews who will die in the subsequent Holocaust are still alive as late as September of 1941, when somewhere in that period between August and October of 1941, as we saw in our previous lecture, the final decision to systematically murder the Jews was made, known as the final solution. We saw that the Operation Reinhardt camps, or Aktion Reinhardt, uh, the annihilation camps, the Vernichtungslagers run by the RSHA, the intelligence community of, 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 of Germany, uh, Treblinka, Sobibor, Belzec. Um, these camps operated between, uh, they began building them in 1941, but they essentially go online in early 19. Uh, 42, and between 1942 and 1943, over approximately 18 month period, um, the Reinhardt camps will, in Treblinka, murder 800,000 people, 40 known survivors, Sobibor, 250,000 people, quarter of a million, 50 known survivors and Belzec 600,000 uh, people with only two known survivors. Um, again, these are um, estimates. You will see numbers that are sometimes higher, sometimes lower, but, but they're all within um, that, that 
relative range there. So approximately uh, 1.6 million uh, Jews murdered in the Reinhardt uh, camps, um, among them as well uh, prisoners of war, but primarily um, the Reinhardt camps were murdering European Jews. There were also, I should mention, uh, Roma um, gypsies murdered in these camps as well as, 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 well as uh, Poles, but again, primarily uh, European Jews were deported to these camps, some from as far away as Greece. This is the point where we now begin to realize that um, the problem for many of um, the killers is psychological. Um, Perpetration-induced post-traumatic stress disorder is the, the term, uh, uh, PI, PTSD. The implementation of uh, gas chambers at Treblinka, Sobibor, Belzec was supposed to um, make the killing, uh, you know, more humane, certainly to relieve the pressure on the killers, as, as I um, remind everybody, the issue of humane killing had nothing to do with any kind of concern for the victim. It was about um, sparing the killers from the trauma of killing. And we saw that um, really this whole notion that Himmler had sought of a decent form of killing, as he described it, didn't really quite work in these camps either. Um, the other issue, of course, is that carbon monoxide uh, that uh, emerges from running tank engines in those uh, gas chambers was not necessarily that effective. Um, the engines often broke down. It's a slower process of killing people. Um, the engine that was run made this terrific noise um, so it, it 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 still was a traumatic experience for the people in um, who found themselves inside these gas chambers and of course um, that trauma once again is 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 uh, kind of reflected back on the killers themselves and 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 so everything that himmler had hoped this kind of seamless decent killing of the Jewish peoples and other victims didn't quite work as we saw. And eventually, of course, as these camps are closed, um, the former T4 staff that were assigned to them are um, transferred to Trieste. They're thrown into combat and not all, but many of them uh, perish in Northern Italy in these encounters with uh, partisans at a rather as I said in the last lecture, a, a, an unusual rate for typical anti-partisan um, units that, that um, you know, had already a higher than average uh, casualty rate. But, but the casualty rate for these former killers was, was extraordinary. So um, a few survive, many will disappear, perhaps as fugitives, we may not know. Uh, but but essentially everything is dispersed as the Russians are approaching from the east towards these camps and the camps themselves were eliminated and, and um, all trace of them was destroyed. This now brings us to the big camp of Auschwitz. Um, Auschwitz, of course, is almost synonymous with the Holocaust. Uh, it's located, um, it's the only death camp that was located on the territory of uh, Germany, but by virtue, um, of course, of that part of Poland being occupied by the Nazis and incorporated in uh, Germany. Um, the death rate at Auschwitz is 
of course, it's the largest of all camps. And, 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 and so we see that the death rate there, um, again, we estimate that approximately 960,000 Jews died at Auschwitz. Um, 865,000 of them estimated were gassed almost immediately upon arrival. Uh, another 74,000 Poles, 21,000 Roma, um, 15,000 Russian POWs, and another 15,000 other Europeans were killed at Auschwitz, um, a total of 1.2 million people murdered. Um, if you look at older statistics, you will see a higher number claimed, but over the last 10, 15 years, in particularly as Poland opened up after the fall of communism and many archives that were held by the Auschwitz Museum were opened up to scholars and to study, we've kind of um, downgraded slightly the number of people killed. Um, so today we believe the total number of deaths at Auschwitz was 1.2 million. Um, it's still an extraordinary number. I mean, we're talking about something like half the population of the city of Toronto murdered in um, this small um, area of, of Europe that made up um, the Auschwitz death camp complex. Remarkable also when you compare it to um, the number of survivors, the small number of survivors from those other camps, um, we know that there were approximately 200,000 known survivors that passed through the camp and, and managed to get out alive, either by being um, eventually transferred to other camps or evacuated or escaped or, or just survived Auschwitz. And there is a reason for that, of course, is first of all, Auschwitz is what we would describe perhaps as a third generation camp. Um, those original German concentration camps that I described a few lectures back were the first generation, they were essentially labor camps. Um, the Reinhardt camps, we can describe as second generation camps. Their purpose was almost exclusively um, the annihilation of um, any people who are dispatched there. Auschwitz kind of was 50-50. Um, Auschwitz functioned as a vast source of slave labor, as, as, as we'll see. Um, the Reinhardt camps were administrated by the German police and Gestapo and SS, the RSHA. Um, Auschwitz was administrated by a different department within the SS. That also changes how that camp is run and how uh, people are inmates and prisoners are used in that uh, camp. And, and in some ways, uh, because there was kind of a, a very intense use of slaves at Auschwitz, there was a chance for people to survive in a slave labor camp in the way there isn't a chance to survive in a death camp like Treblinka, Belzec, or, 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 or Sobibor. So uh, the RSHA, again, uh, is, is the policing part of the SS. The WVHA is the department that ran Auschwitz, unlike the um, Reinhardt camps and the WVHA as well ran the German concentration camps. Here it is, the WVHA, the Economic Administration Main Office that I had described to you uh, several lectures earlier when we looked at the structure of the SS. And uh, the WVHA, as I say, ran not only the slave labor camps, the concentration camps, uh, but it also ran a number of uh, corporations that produced everything from 
um, porcelain to mineral water, uh, brickwork, construction material, and they were using, of course, slave labor. Its head was Oswald, Oswald Pohl, a former naval paymaster. Um, he's one uh, of um, Himmler's Knights of the Round Table at Wevelsburg, um, part of, as I say, the empire of uh, the SS. He is a uh, general in the SS. He's here on, on, on the left. An educated man. Uh, it certainly doesn't appear to be a monster, and, and yet, of course, um, the entire German concentration camp system in Auschwitz really was part of, of his domain. Pohl will be arrested after the war. Uh, and he will be uh, tried in uh, the Green series of trials. He's not um, a defendant in the major Nuremberg trials, but in the subsequent trials, he's one of the defendants. Oswald Pohl, in fact, um, will be one of the last Nazi war criminals to be executed by the Americans um, in, in, in this series of uh, military tribunal trials. Um, he'll be executed in, in, in 1951. Um, and he, of course, um, claims to have been converted to Catholicism uh, by 1951. There's a cry in Germany to uh, pardon Oswald uh, Pohl. And um, by then, of course, as, as we're in the midst of the Cold War, there was a tendency to begin to pardon many Nazi war criminals uh, to kind of um, appease the West German uh, population, the military, um, uh, you know, of course, many World War II officers and so forth were now serving in the new West German army, as there were in the East German army. Um, and, and so there was this move to essentially um, end the prosecutions of, of war criminals, except for the worst of the worst, and a tendency to commute um, death sentences and, and reincorporate um, former Nazis who might have been efficient policemen or efficient soldiers back into the worst German establishment. Um, and and um, essentially on the communist side in East Germany, similar um, process was taking place. Many former Gestapo officers ended up working for um, West German authorities as much as they did for the East German authorities, and many were recruited by both American and Soviet intelligence as well. Pohl is not spared. Pohl will be put to death 7th of June, 1951. He's executed. And Oswald Pohl today is buried where many SS war criminals are, are buried, um, still under these kinds of cult-like um, grave markers that the SS used. Um, this is where Pohl is buried as, as well. Um, as I say, many of um, the killers are, are, are buried there. This is the prison yard cemetery of the Landsburg prison, the same prison where um, Hitler served after the beer hall uh, putsch. And it's here that Oswald Pohl was, was buried. These plaques have subsequently been removed, as you can see from this picture. They're now anonymous graves, but at one point um, there, there, there used to be uh, as I say, names for every Nazi war criminal buried in this uh, yard. They're primarily SS officers. And so, as I say, they're buried under these pagan gravestones 
or grave markers to this day. The operation of Auschwitz essentially depended on slaves, as did um, all the concentration camps and all the um, so-called subsidiary slave labor camps. The life expectancy of a slave was approximately nine months. You can see here the condition in which the last um, nine month shift of slaves um, who survived by virtue of being liberated. You can see the condition they were found in. This was a particularly cruel um, form of uh, slavery. And uh, we can see that the Nazis, according to this document, um, calculated the exact profit that they would make on a slave prior to um, their death after nine months of deprivation and beatings and uh, hard labor. Um, you can see how it's translated into English. Below, um, each slave was rented for approximately six Reichsmarks a day. So again, one Reichsmark was equivalent to 25 uh, cents US at that time. Um, deduction for nourishment, 60 uh, fenning or 60 cents, 0. 0.6 of a, Reich, a Reichsmark. Um, so 60 cents for uh, what it takes to feed um, a slave for a day. And, and, and of course, the Essentially, the food was um, slop. You were um, lucky if you got a bowl of soup with some kind of resemblance of um, some kind of fat in it. Uh, forget meat, forget coffee, forget anything else. So es es essentially, people survived on a um, on a slice of bread and and some kind of watery soup. Um, so the average life expectancy is calculated by Nazi accountants, uh, 270 days by uh, Reichsmarks, five Reichsmarks, 30 Fenning, uh, 1,431 Reichsmarks total, uh, minus amortization on clothing, 10 Fenning. So the, the SS accountants um, actually calculate the immortalization of, of the rags you see that people are wearing as clothing. Um, then profits from the rational utilization of the corpse, um, gold teeth that are yanked from people's mouths after their death, um, their clothing, which is recycled, any articles of value or money confiscated from them, then the accountants deduct two Reichsmarks for the cost of cremating the body. And so the average net profit is uh, 200 Reichsmark per slave once they die. Um, total profit um, in nine months amounts to 1,631 Reichsmarks. Um, and, and notice the last um, note in the accountant's report, this estimate does not include profits from the sale of bones and ashes of the dead, which were used uh, for fertilizer. So the kind of um, exploitive evil um, right down to the corpse of the victim uh, is, is, is a kind of, I, I, I think, the the epitome of um, corporate evil, because again, this was essentially a profit-driven operation. It's German corporations that rented these slaves um, and worked these slaves to the death in order that the corporations can remain competitive in, in, in the market. The biggest abuser, um, IG Farben Industries, uh, I had already described to you this, this, this company. It's actually a conglomerate of multiple companies, IG Farben Industries. 
the IG Farben Industries is several hundred different companies, most of them focused on petrochemical production. They are kind of the um, petrochemical arsenal of Nazi Germany. This is what their corporate headquarters looked like in Frankfurt. The building still stands today. Uh, now it's a uh, university, but at that time, this is the corporate headquarters. As I say, um, IG Farben was the fourth largest corporation in the world um, after General Motors, American Steel, and Standard Oil of New Jersey. IG Farben came fourth in the world. Um, Bayer, for example, uh, you may know it as the aspirin maker, but Bayer is part of the IG Farben complex. Um, Bayer, of course, used concentration camp inmates to test their pharmaceuticals on. Uh, Bayer produced, of course, aluminol, the barbiturate that was used uh, to kill some uh, the handicapped and children in Operation T4. We, of course, all know it as the aspirin maker, still in business today. Uh, BASF, Badische Annerlein Soda Fabriken, uh, also a company. Um, some of you who might be older may uh, remember BASF uh, audio tape. Um, of course, BSF as well produced videotape, um, CDs, DVDs at, at one point, same company, still in business. This is the company that was not only part of IG Farben, but um, as well produced on order those um, metal cylinders with carbon monoxide that were used in the T4 gas chambers. Um, there's no known industrial use for bottled carbon monoxide other than to kill people. And BASF is still in business today. Um, of course, nobody uses uh, videotape, audio tape now. Um, and BASF now is focused primarily on producing ethanol. Still in business. Uh, just as I, I keep saying, Tyson Corporation, uh, Tyson Elevators um, are, you know, Tyson Company is one of the first companies that um, its founder, Tyson, uh, one of the first companies that uh, began to finance the Nazis even before Hitler became chancellor. That's the same Tyson that operates um, our elevators at Ryerson. Uh, Agfa as well, the Agfa Film Company, part of BASF. Agfa today is um, in the health insurance business. So uh, these corporations, uh, their kind of corporate structure still exists. Many of them have changed their businesses to other kind of products or services, but the corporate entities still exist as they existed in Nazi Germany. Um, Shareholders come and go, they die. Company directors come and go, they die. But corporate assets live on forever, even if those corporate assets were earned through the murder of millions of people. As I say, Agfa now provides health care. It's a major corporate health care provider in the Windsor, Ontario area, for example. These company directors um, were put on trial again in that green series. You'll see that there's a separate uh, volume for the board of directors of IG Farben. Here they are, including Herman Schmitz, who's the CEO of IG Farben. Remember, he also sat on the board of directors of that bank in Switzerland, the Bank of International Settlement that um, I described to you, uh, where Holocaust assets were laundered. And I'll get into that a little bit 
uh, deeper uh, further in the lecture. All of them get relatively light sentences. Uh, most of them are back in business by the 1950s. They're, they're rebuilding West German industry. Auschwitz is going to be built in partnership with IG Farben. And it's almost custom built by Himmler with uh, corporate executives touring the facilities and kind of fine tuning how Auschwitz is going to work with um, the various IG Farben installations and factories that will be built around Auschwitz. And here you can see some of the IG Farben engineers and, and members of the board touring Auschwitz under construction and discussing planning how these uh, facilities are going to function. You're looking um, at an aerial photograph of the Auschwitz region. This is taken by the United States Air Force in the summer of 1944 at the height of the killing at, at Auschwitz. Um, the distance you're looking at is approximately from the top, if this was over um, Toronto, uh, you're looking from approximately, I guess, Lawrence Avenue on the top down to the lakeshore at uh, the bottom. And if we zoom in closer, we can see the so-called two camps that made up the main part of, of um, Auschwitz. This is a photograph that was snapped, as I say, by the U.S. Air Force on the way to bomb um, the IG Farben factory facilities that were around Auschwitz. And it's a very controversial issue why Auschwitz itself was not uh, bombed. That's a whole lecture um, in itself. Um, some argue that um, fighting Nazi Germany was um, the kind of saving the Jews was not a priority for the Allies. The military defeat of Germany was. Um, Others argue that it would have been impossible to bomb Auschwitz without uh, killing inmates who were confined there. Um, others argue as well that Auschwitz was relatively well defended by anti-aircraft installations. Um, the question of whether, you know, why not bomb the railways? And you can make out all the railway lines that kind of lead into the camp itself. And you can see all the barracks there. Um, the counter argument to that, of course, is, is that railways, uh, once bombed, are um, very easy to repair. Um, I've, I've talked to people who lived in Berlin during the bombings. Um, in, in Berlin, you have kind of a elevated uh, train system, kind of like in Chicago or in certain parts of New York. Uh, people told me that, you know, they'd wake up in the morning after a bombing and uh, they would have to take a, a uh, temporary bus to work. Uh, but once they finished their shift at the end of the day, um, the bombed out railway tracks would have already been fixed by the end of the day so that factory workers can return on the elevator trains after a bombing of a daily bombing of Berlin. So railway tracks are um, very difficult to um, destroy completely by aerial bombing. So that's one uh, kind of response as to why the... Um, uh, you know, Auschwitz was not bombed. There is a book, um, Auschwitz and the Allies, that looks deeper into this uh, question as as to, uh, you know, why wasn't Auschwitz bombed? Especially, as I say, since we have these aerial photographs taken by uh, United States Air Force bombers that passed over Auschwitz um, bombing missions. Here, uh, you can see the first Auschwitz camp 
the old one. Uh, it was known as Auschwitz I or the Stammlager, the main uh, camp. This was a former uh, Polish army cavalry barrack. At one point, um, the Nazis will take it over. They will use it to at first keep Polish prisoners of war there, then eventually Polish resistors, um, Poles that they intend to murder in um, the ethnic cleansing of Poland as well, will end up being um, confined in Auschwitz I. And then you have um, Auschwitz Birkenau or Auschwitz II, and this is a much larger camp now. It um, they begin building it in uh, late 1940, early 1941. It's at first intended to house Russian POWs as the Nazis were preparing for Operation Barbarossa, but um, the Nazis, of course, will make a decision to, in, instead of keeping Russian prisoners of war, that they will kill most of the POWs on the spot where um, they're captured. In fact, um, Russian POWs are not extended the uh, privileges and protections of the Geneva Convention. Uh, they will be essentially starved to death and murdered in these huge open air in enclosures where they're kept and some will arrive in the death camps as well but the majority of uh, red army prisoners and not only russians but ukrainians and other ethnicities white russians um you know the soviet union of course was a multicultural society um they're all essentially systematically murdered by the million in these, uh, or I should say by the millions, uh, in the plural, in these open air uh, camps. The camp as well, the complex here you're looking at, um, has a capacity for approximately 150,000 prisoners. So it's a small city you're looking at. Um, in yellow, you can see the first IG Farben um, factories. There's munitions are being produced in those factories marked out in yellow. And, and, and of course, um, slaves from the Starnlager are working on, on those, um, in those munition factories. And there eventually will be an uprising in Auschwitz and um, uh, it's female munition workers who smuggle grenades from those factories into the camp that provide the prisoners with some means of um, resistance. But that comes very late. Uh, that will be around October of 1944, that, that large revolt of a Zonderkommando, which again, I'll get to that a um, couple of minutes down the line here. So those, that yellow you're looking at is the first um, factory complex built around um, the old camp. But as the new camp goes up, IG Farben now builds what will become known as Monowitz or Auschwitz III or the Buna complex, this massive, massive industrial park where um, thousands and thousands of slaves will be sent to once they arrive and are processed at Auschwitz. Uh, basically, the procedure is, is uh, people arrive on one of those train routes at Auschwitz and um, those who cannot work, the aged, children, handicapped, uh, disabled, are immediately sent into the gas chamber while um, anyone who's capable of work is kept on, um, as they say, for at least nine months before they'll just die um, from deprivation and beatings and, and, and hunger. So Auschwitz is this kind of processing center for disposable slaves that are then deployed into this huge, massive industrial park. 
Uh, here you can see closer some of the factories there. Um, the IG Farben is producing, first of all, synthetic fuel. Um, this is um, a gasoline that um, doesn't use uh, oil. It's a completely synthetic chemical compound. And, and the problem, of course, is um, since it's not using a fossil fuel, um, this chemical compound is very expensive to produce uh, unless, of course, you use slaves for labor. And, and so slave labor combined with synthetic fuel is competitive with fossil fuel uh, gasoline. Uh, there's, um, you can see a place marked out as Auschwitz III, Buna. Buna is a synthetic rubber that they're using for war purposes um, as of course you know rubber is a natural for used to be a natural material gathered from sap from asia and and of course as germany is gradually blockaded uh, rubber has to be synthetically produced there's um, a power plant that uh supplies electricity and power to that region. There's a mining and processing area. And again, everything is linked by railroads con conveniently. This is what it looks like from the ground. Imagine you're looking at a slave labor uh, installation. This is the power plant that's feeding power to all those factories and plants there. This is what um, some of that industrial park looks like today. It's still operating. Of course, the poles have taken over this installation and um, some factories, of course, are uh, no longer um, working or, or, or functioning. So others have been converted for other purposes. Those huge cooling towers are still standing there today. And here you see some uh, actually slaves working on a construction project, right, you know, roughly in the same spot you're looking here. This is today. This is in the 1940s, slaves working at that facility. People were um, identified, here's, um, you know, a ID card, again, uh, IG Farben Industry, uh, Auschwitz work, work, work identification. Here again, you can see uh, concentration cap slaves at work in one of the plants. These are one of the few rare color photographs of the slave labor installations. If we zoom in a little closer, uh, you can make out virtually a small city of barracks, as I say, um, the capacity there was approximately 155,000 prisoners. That's a small town or a small city. And we can transpose this to a graphic image of the barracks. You can see how um, there's various sections in the camp there's a uh, you know a woman's camp um, there's a quarantine camp there's a, a family camp a hungarian women's camp gypsy camp uh, prisoners a hospital section and and and, and so forth um, and and here up in uh, the 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 top part of the camp you can see that there are uh, gas chambers, permanent gas chambers installed. These are also 
uh, second generation gas chambers as compared to the ones that were run by tank engines, these will be using a very different gas compound, a much more lethal and quick acting gas compound known as Zyklone B, also produced by IG Farben. It's a product of IG Farben. Here, I'll superimpose this chart on an aerial photograph of Auschwitz as it looks today. And here you can see what the Museum of Auschwitz looks like, how some of the sections have now been overgrown, um, parts of the camp, uh, housing has been built over it. Uh, but a good portion of it now survives as a museum and kind of as a monument to the Holocaust. This certainly is a much larger facility than the small kind of Ryerson campus sized uh, uh, Reinhardt camps that I described. If you look down, there's that brown building we're looking at is of course that that uh, kind of iconic gate into Auschwitz and those little dark spots um, those are tour buses that have arrived with tourists so that again gives you some scale of how large this facility is there's that gate from the inside and again you can see how the train used to run right through here and and you can see how the tracks kind of double into two tracks so inmates were brought right in by train into this camp and then they would be unloaded and who lives or who dies would be chosen in the process known as uh, selection but that's that's the gate that's what it looks like today from inside the camp If we um, kind of measure um, the, the, the distance, it approximately, if you superimpose it over a map of Toronto, um, it roughly will fit between Spadina Avenue on the west and Parliament Street on the right, on, uh, sorry, on the east, uh, Dundas on the south and Bloor Street on uh, the north. So essentially um, uptown or midtown Toronto is the size of um, Auschwitz. You can see uh, the Ryerson University campus uh, would be just a, a small portion of the Auschwitz complex. In fact, um, people working at Auschwitz would, would um, either have to have a Jeep or a bicycle um, you know, when they were, you know, moving around, I'm talking about the guards, when they were moving around the camp, it, it wasn't a, a camp that you can easily walk through or walk across. Um, you would need some transportation even within the camp. And there's kind of a scaling of it. As I say, this is kind of a rough scale. I'll transpose this uh, two-dimensional image um, into a three-dimensional model of, of, of the camp. You know, help us to look at the various parts of the camp and how they uh, functioned. Again, the gate is up here. Um, the train would come in and, and uh, would deliver inmates on this ramp here as it becomes known and here you can see the gas chambers conveniently placed right by the arrival ramp so that no fuss no muss those who die can be within the hour walked into the gas chamber and and killed the capacity of the gas chamber again estimated somewhere between um 2,000 to some estimates as high as 4,000, but um, let's safely say 2,000 people could be killed uh, at one time in one of these gas chambers. So they're massive gas chambers. There'll be uh, five gas chambers at Auschwitz. The first one is built at the old 
camp. It um, was not very large, and and um, the it's known as um, if you're going through historical literature, it's it's known as Crema One or Crematorium One, the one at Aush, the one at the old Auschwitz Stammlager, and then the one at Auschwitz Birkenau. Birkenau, by the way, means uh, birch trees. There were a lot of birch trees, as you can see here. There's kind of a birch tree cluster, and and so Auschwitz Two, that second camp um, was was named Auschwitz Birkenau for the birch trees. Here you can see two of um, the uh, first gas chambers and we can superimpose them over a higher definition aerial photograph again taken by the United States Air Force and released publicly somewhere in the uh, early 1960s. This uh, is the aerial photograph as labeled um, by um, the CIA. This was kept in uh, CIA archives and, and, and then released uh, publicly, as they say, in the 1960s. And if you look at this photograph, you can see, for example, a group of prisoners on their way to the gas chamber, which is right here. Um, it's it's in uh, underground gas chamber located right there where those four shadows are. Those are kind of um, vents or uh, chimneys, as they're often referred to, through which gas would have been introduced in pallet form. It would have been poured into the gas chamber. Um, so you can see a group of prisoners who have uh, arrived on a train here uh, and you see a group of prisoners on their way to walk they're going to walk through this open gate uh, they're going to go by this kind of garden here everything about this building will um, uh, kind of give them a sense of um, to calm them down so sometimes there's an orchestra playing music there um, again just like in the reinhardt camps prisoners are told um, they're going to have a shower um, hurry up you know we have breakfast waiting for you your breakfast is getting cold get in the shower while we still have warm water for you and once you have your shower and breakfast you'll all be given work assignments they're they're, they're just told these lies Essentially, um, you know, women and children uh, will uh, get light work assignments, able-bodied men will get heavy assignments. So everything about the kind of procedure is meant to lull people into passively walking into those gas chambers without rioting, without much um, fuss, or forcing, again, guards to interact with prisoners in a way that may traumatize the guards. Prisoners will then walk down a staircase uh, just right here on the right of this building. This is known as um, kind of the undressing chamber, uh, like a, almost like a locker room, except there aren't any lockers there. There will only be numbered pegs on the wall. Prisoners will be told to, uh, well, you know, um, I hate to call them prisoners because they're not actually being imprisoned. They're being murdered. Victims are, are told to um, hang their clothing on the peg. Uh, make sure that you tie your shoes together, the laces, so that you don't lose your shoes, that you pair your shoes. And please remember the number on the peg so you can pick up your clothing after the shower. Um, and of course, what essentially the victims are doing is packing their own clothing for the recycling process because they'll never come out of the gas chamber and then they're walked in to this chamber here and um, medical officers from the ss so-called disinfection officers uh, usually non-commissioned officers like sergeants who then pour ziklone z z uh, pellets through those vents killing everybody inside. Uh, the bodies are then lifted up on elevators and 
uh, raised into this main chamber here where there are furnaces that will, will burn them in the crematorium. So th um, by virtue of the fact that the first crematorium is built um, in the old camp, this one becomes known and is known in literature, in most literature. Sometimes you'll see the numbering system slightly different, but this one is known as crematorium two and crematorium three. They're made with concrete basements for gas chambers and they're brick buildings that hold the crematorium. Um, there will be two more built later um, these ones have no basements. They're essentially made uh, from a wooden structure, and these will become known as uh, Crema 4 and Crema 5. They're built a little later than the other two. So um, let's say if we take the mid number, 2,000 people, so we're, we're talking about the capacity to kill uh, over four crematoria. Um, again, the, the one in the old Auschwitz, Crema 1, is taken offline, is too small. We're talking about a capacity to kill um, approximately 8,000 people per per um, gassing and and um, cremate that many bodies. So and and of course the crematoriums are running um, you know round the clock 24 seven. In the center between the crematoria, you have a, a zone called Canada. Uh, the name Canada is, it's not quite clear. There's two different reasons why. Uh, that is a kind of sorting facility where prisoners' clothing, um, any valuable objects they brought with them, their luggage and so forth is sorted. Uh, all the shoes are grouped together, all the, you know, shirts, eyeglasses, and, and so forth are sorted there, and eventually they're packaged and put back on the train and brought back to Germany, where the material is recycled into the German population and into the German military. The term Canada, partly, um, some say the term comes Canada because um, it's located um, at the far end of the camp, and Canada is kind of seen as being located on the far end of the globe towards uh, the North Pole. Um, the other explanation for the nickname Canada is that this is where all the riches that belong to inmates were located, and, and, and Canada, uh, you know, had a kind of reputation as a land of wealth, and, 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 and the rich, little did they know. Uh, but um, so those are, it's never quite clear why in the end it ended up being called Canada, but it was. If we look now down the ramp, we can see what it looked like uh, in reality. This is a series of photographs that were taken by an SS photographer for some kind of documentation reason. We don't know why uh, the photographer is standing on the roof of a, a train that has just brought these people in through that gate in the background there. Uh, you can already see that the women and children are sorted to one side. All the males are sorted to the other side. Uh, you can see at least one guard with a kind of um, cattle cane. Uh, if any of you have seen um, at slaughterhouses, for example, how cattle are, are moved, often uh, slaughterhouse and meatpacking workers um, use these canes to kind of nudge and beat cattle into a uh, ramp 
towards um, the meat processing factory. Well, um, you'll see that many of the guards, and you might have seen it as well at, at the other camp photos. There's, there's an image of um, that, that uh, excavator, and one of the guards is uh, kind of jokingly pushing another one with one of those um, cattle canes. Um, so th this is kind of a thing you see in these camps, guards with these uh, canes. So that's the direction you're looking at, approximately from where the photograph was taken. If we now reverse the view the other way, towards the gas chamber here, towards Crema 2, uh, we have this photograph. And there in the background, um, you could see how just innocuous the gas chamber in Crematoria looked like. Uh, it was just another building among many at, at Auschwitz. You as well see um, trustees, so-called Zonderkommandos, working among um, the guards. In fact, in fact, you see more Zonderkommandos in those uh, striped uniforms. Uh, there would be 13 Zonderkommandos at Auschwitz through its history. These are people, mostly uh, Jews, who were given an opportunity to volunteer to work in the gas chamber. Again, um, the Germans themselves did not like handling bodies and getting into the gas chamber. So it was left to the Zonder commandos to do this. Um, if you volunteered to do this service, um, you would have been treated relatively uh, well, well fed. Um, you can see all of them have kind of towels wrapped around their necks. It must have been a hot, sweaty day. Uh, they're all well nourished. Um, as long as they don't um, commit any infractions, they're treated well. They can eat as much as they can find amongst prisoners' uh, belongings. Um, and, and they lived actually in the attic on top here um, above the crematorium. So they did not circulate in the general population. And, and part of their work was to calm people down. Uh, people would see fellow Jews who are already um, in the camp. Um, they all, as I say, look healthy. None of them um, are beaten with bruises and so forth. And, and, and so um, they're kind of, the, you know, the expression Judas goats. Um, their purpose essentially is to, is, uh, you know, calm people down and assist the guards in translating into the different languages, because I say people are arriving at Auschwitz from all different parts of, of, of the camp. And so the Zonderkommandos, their job is to translate, calm down people and kind of guide them to their deaths into the um, gas chamber. The only catch being on a Zonderkommando was that every few months, um, the entire Zonderkommando would then be killed off. Um, and and um, many of them knew this. The, the, they knew also, though, that um, they would be shot rather than put in the gas chamber. So um, some chose this way to die as a, as a kind of a more um, merciful way to die rather than being gassed. Um, the other thing, of course, is some hope that somehow if they managed to hang on, to life for another three months or two months as a Zonder commando, that maybe they have an opportunity to, to, to survive. And, and um, the ethical questions of becoming a Zonder commando is, 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 is a huge um, issue. Uh, Primo Levi, um, an Italian philosopher who ends up at Auschwitz and survives Auschwitz, will, of course, write a number of books about the Holocaust and surviving it. And one of his books is called The Gray Zone, um, about this issue of the Sonder Commandos being in the gray zone. Are they victims or are they perpetrators or are they something in between, um, uh, you know, between the black and the white uh, in, in, in the gray zone? Because in the end, of course, they too end up 
uh, dying with everyone else, uh, albeit three, two or three months later. As I say, there are 13 Zonder commandos. Uh, in October of 1944, the 13th Zonder Commando on uh, Zonder Commando, by the way, means special unit or special special squad. Um, the 13th Zonder Commando in of October of 1944, using smuggled munitions that women smuggle from one of the factories there, will actually rise up and blow up permanently one of the gas chambers in October. Um, they succeed in, in blowing it up, a gas chamber and a crematorium. And um, they are though all murdered immediately by the SS guards that are working at Auschwitz. But that gas chamber then is um, taken offline and it's, it's never started up again. Although, um, you know, we're talking about October of 44 gassings at Auschwitz will officially cease on the order of um, Heinrich Himmler as he begins to realize that um, Nazi Germany is going to lose the war. He orders that the gassing cease around October, November of 1944. And shortly after that, the gas chambers are dismantled and they will be blown up so that no trace uh, well, there's traces, the, the, the ground foundations will be there, but um, the gassing um, ventilators, the uh, crematorium ovens and so forth will be dismantled and uh, destroyed. You can see actually these two women here um, are quite happy. They think the worst part of their journey has just ended. That, um, you know, some of them have been traveling without food or water uh, for days and days along a railway, as they say, from far as, from as far as Greece. Often they find themselves uh, for hours standing still. Uh, you know, the railways are sometimes bom uh, bombed. People are dying aboard these trains. They're, they're crowded, they're suffocating. Um, and, and, and so they think the worst is over. They're, they're quite happy. She looks like she's recognized somebody that she's waving to them. And, and none of these people realize that um, their children, their elderly, uh, some of them are, are within the next hour going to be marched into that crematorium, into that gas chamber, and are going to go out that chimney uh, burnt uh, to just reduce to ashes within an hour to 90 minutes of, of arrival. Everything looks normal. These are architectural photographs taken by the building company when they were building the crematorium. So we can see kind of what the back looks like. And again, these four chimneys, um, Holocaust deniers have uh, alleged that the CIA is part of um, the Holocaust myth conspiracy, uh, that they airbrushed those chimneys into uh, this photograph. If you look at um, the size of it, if we sample the train here and, and, and move the train next to the uh, crematorium, we could see that the gas chamber crematorium is approximately six train lengths in uh, length. So we're talking about um, a crematorium that's about the size and a gas chamber that's about the size of a uh, Toronto subway station. So imagine how many people you could cram into a space like that, you know, minus the train, right? Um, how many people? You can easily cram 2,000 people into one of those gas chambers, if not more. Here you can see 
people arriving on the train. These are, again, these photographs were taken approximately in the spring of 1944. So we're seeing um, Hungarian and Romanian Jews arriving to be murdered at Auschwitz. Zonder commandos. Now um, the sorting process begins um, as women and children are lined up on one side, uh, men on the other side. You can see there's an officer standing uh, overlooking the, the columns. Um, that is going to be a medical officer, a doctor. And of course, that's the key to um, perfecting the trauma issue in uh, the murder. The Nazis are going to medicalize now the killing process at, at Auschwitz. Uh, doctors will now choose who lives or who dies. Uh, they will gesture left or right as they look at um, an individual. You can see he's just sent a woman with an infant in her arm towards um, the gas chamber. The, the reason she's going to die is because, of course, somebody has to carry the baby into the gas chamber. And so the mother um, is going to carry her, her child into the gas chamber and will die with the gas chamber. Some Zonder commandos have been known if they're out of each earshot of um, Nazi uh, guards, if they see a young woman who would have been spared as a slave had she not had an infant in her child they um, kind of whispered to her oh you know give your baby uh, to your mother or to your grandmother um, they're going to end up in a uh, kind of children's camp or elderly camp um, you'll go to work at, at a sewing station or, or or something so hand over your baby to to her your baby will be better fed um, and by doing that they save the woman's life but of course, after a few days, as she begins to wonder, you know, where's my child? Can I go visit my mother? Can I see her um, at a barbed wire fence somewhere? And, and gradually she realizes that um, by virtue of handing over her child to her grandmother or mother, she's actually put her child to death. You as well see this one individual here who's standing in neither either line. Um, he's not in the male line. He's not in the, the elderly people's line. Uh, as I say, he's, he's, he's standing there with one shoe. He is in some kind of um, disoriented, traumatized uh, condition. And you can already see uh, he, they're kind of circling him like wolves. Um, he is going to be very quickly taken out of this group and he will be taken behind a train and quickly shot, um, again, as not to cause chaos. Um, everybody wants a kind of an orderly killing procedure that's very clinical, very synthetic. So um, the question, of course, is um, why doctors? Here you can see they're choosing people who are going to live. You, of course, don't need a um, medical degree to distinguish a, a, a old person or a, uh, you know, elderly woman or child. Uh, you don't need a medical degree for, for that. Um, a, a corporal, any one of you could do that job. Um, the reason, of course, is once again that 
notion that the syringe belongs in the hand of the physician. Uh, that is a key to de-traumatizing the killing process. You now have doctors who are making the choice. Uh, it's a medical procedure. So the sergeant, the corporal no longer feel they're part of a killing process. They're just essentially following doctors' orders in a medical procedure. And doctors, of course, physicians in every society have a huge power over your uh, body. Um, you know, um, I, as your professor, if I, um, you know, take a sharp edged uh, blade and open your chest and take your heart out, um, I'm going to end up in a prison. If a doctor does that, they're going to collect a six figure salary. Uh, so, this kind of power to intervene in the human body. Um, is something that physicians are uniquely endowed with. And of course, now this power has been extended in Germany for a physician to be able to make a decision for medical reasons to terminate someone's life. And, and so the entire process as Auschwitz now will be medicalized in this way. No trauma. It's all a medical procedure. Here you can see an SS uh, physician with, with that, that the physician symbol right there in a triangle on, 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 on his sleeve. These doctors serve on the ramp, as I say, ostensibly their job is to uh, sort which people are healthy enough uh, for work and who cannot sustain work. But of course, that's completely bullshit. Um, their purpose, as they say, is to choose people to die um, under kind of a medical prerogative they have. That's why the gas, when it's inserted into the gas chamber, is also inserted by medical personnel, junior so-called disinfection officers or hygiene um, officers uh, who work under a doctor's supervision. So the entire killing process is medicalized. And of course, that brings us to the case of the infamous Dr. Uh, Josef Mengele, the way the SS is luring many of these doctors to work in a concentration camp is in, in this death camp and do this kind of work is to offer them grants to conduct their own research. And, and, and so um, Josef Mengele was very interested in um, genetic research, particularly into twins and the idea of what you know what you can learn from twins um, in uh, for the purposes of perhaps cloning perfect racial uh, Germans. And so Mengele is um, a Waffen SS officer in the fifth Waffen SS division, Viking division. He uh, serves in Russia 1941-42. He is severely wounded there. Uh, and, and so once he comes back, they um, retire him essentially from military services. And um, he's offered this enormous grant by his former professor. Um, if he wants to go to Auschwitz, he can use any prisoners there that he chooses for his medical experiments um, in between the time he is doing a ramp duty. And, and, and so Mengele um, becomes, in fact, he's the highest decorated um, SS officer at Auschwitz. So I say he has all these decorations from his war service as, as a medical officer in Russia. And so somewhere in 1943, Mengele arrives um, at Auschwitz and takes up ramp duty. And, and um, 
he of course is notorious for those um, that kind of gap in his teeth was a way of identifying him here we see some photographs of Mengele partying at Auschwitz there was a little resort camp near Auschwitz where guards and officers could go on their day off or on the weekend and and here you can see Mengele among them uh, among the killers and, and certainly again they don't look like monsters Mengele is notorious for his ramp duty he um, is remembered uh, whistling Schumann to himself as he kind of very cavalierly sends people left or right to life or death uh, but whenever he sees twins arriving um, his eyes kind of go aglow because he's as I say he's very interested in um, twin genetics and 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 so he immediately selects twins for his own uh, laboratory and um, guards are instructed that you know no harm is to come to the twins um, Mengele always has you know candy in his pocket he gives tw these twins immediately candy he um, is remembered as kind of you know very kindly a lot of the twins call him um, you know uncle Yosef um, he's uh, show seems to be very compassionate and caring of all his twins but he immediately um, once he gets his hands on them begins um, these horrific experiments on 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 twins um, he is um, injecting various colored dyes into their eyes attempting to change their eyes he is uh, attempting uh, transplants of organs between twins and other um, kooky crazy uh, experiments that that result often in the death of of, of these twins when the Russians enter Auschwitz um, in, in January, Auschwitz is liberated by the Red Army. Um, they find all these surviving twins that Mengele hadn't managed to get his hands on. So Mengele becomes known as the angel of death because indeed he's, he's, he's kind of always remembered as kind of being very um, neatly uniformed, uh, kind of very pleasant, as they say, um, not the crazy, insane Dr. Frankenstein that apparently he really is. And so as the angel of death, Mer um, Mengele, of course, becomes uh, notorious. You can see all, all, all these surviving kids showing the numbers tattooed on their arms. Mengele will be among... Um, one of the most wanted war criminals after uh, the war. There are all these sightings of, 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 of Mengele. He does succeed escaping to uh, South America, to uh, Paraguay, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he comes from a very wealthy family of, of uh, tractor makers, uh, the Mengele tractor fa factory agricultural goods and and so the Mengele corporation which is family owned supports uh Mengele under the name of Gregor Helmuth in um in South America and and the accountant from the Mengele corporation visits delivering money uh to Mengele where he remains in in hiding never caught and Mengele eventually um, is swimming on the beach and he'll um, have a stroke and and he'll die on a sunny day on the beach uh, completely having gotten away with these horrific crazy murders that he had uh, committed Brazil is where he dies, um, 1979. Nobody knows this for quite a long time. Eventually, it's leaked 
that Mengele might have died on this Brazilian beach and, and they uh, search for where he might have been buried and, and the, the, um, the remains are now uh, exhumed and, and Mengele is uh, positively identified. So this role of, 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 of doctors at Auschwitz, this, this kind of medicalization of the process to relieve the killers of the trauma of, of, of killing is described by Robert J. Lifton in his book, The Nazi Doctors. Um, this is really probably the best book on the German medical uh, profession in all its aspects, uh, extermination, euthanasia, the ramp selection duty, and as well, experimentation. Robert J. Lifton is a psychiatrist. He actually went and interviewed some of the doctors who participated in um, the, the, the Holocaust, kind of um, doctor to doctor. And, 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 and so he writes kind of about the psychology of the doctors and how it worked in the various, um, in the various uh, uh, functions that these doctors performed. And um, he describes a, a, a prisoner in the book. There's a prisoner who, who kind of points out to lift in the role of doctors at Auschwitz. He, 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 um, he says, first, the chief doctor's assignments to his subordinates concerning duty schedule and immediate selection policies. Second, the individual doctor's service on the ramp, performing selections, quote, in a very noble, seemingly kind manner, uh, polite and kind. Third, the doctor riding in the ambulance or Red Cross car to the crematoria. Fourth, the doctor ordering how many pellets of gas should be thrown into these holes from the ceilings according to the number of people and who should do it. There were three or four disinfection officers. Uh, fifth, he observed through the peephole how the people are dying. Sixth, when the people were dead, he gave the order to ventilate to open the gas chamber, and he came in with a gas mask into the chamber. Seventh, he signed a form that the people are dead and how long it took. And eighth, he observed and supervised the teeth extraction from the corpses. So this is completely different from the gassing procedures at say Belzec or Treblinka or Sobibor. Um, you have doctors supervising the entire procedure. Um, in other words, it is uh, completely uh, medicalized. One prisoner, a uh, former prisoner, um, Taos uh, Lifton, he says, um, they considered themselves performing Therapia Magna Auschwitziense, TM. They would use the initials TM. At first, it was mockingly and ironically, but gradually they began to use them simply to mean the gas chambers. So whenever you see the initials TM, that's what it means. The phrase was invented by Dr. Schumann, who fancied himself an academic intellectual among the intelligentsia of the Auschwitz doctor. By that phrase, they meant for an instance, saving people from typhus epidemics. They were doing them a favor. So the term Therapia Magna Auschwitzen, of course, is derived as a joke by Dr. Schumann at Auschwitz from the medical term Therapia Magna Sterilisans, um, which is a, a kind of a one-dose treatment of um, some kind of in infection to sterilize an, um, an, an, an infection. So essentially, um, the doctors are seeing as performing a kind of healing on the body of the German Volksgemeinschaft who are infected by a Jewish cancer, Therapia Magna, Magna Auschwitziense, TM. Uh, that's, that's just how perverse now 
um, the Nazi genocide and the final solution has become. That's the, the, the extreme limit that they had taken it to and the kind of perfection they've now reached and again alleviating uh, perpetration induced uh, PTSD among the killers. They're completely relieved of the killing. No sergeant can claim that he led anybody to death. He was just um, helping doctors doing the medical work. And, and, and again, thank God that the Nazis uh, come up with this so late in the procedure rather than in the beginning, because had they, had they figured out this route, um, one can just speculate how many uh, people they could have murdered successfully in this kind of uh, procedure rather than uh, the kind of um, on and off and um, disordered and chaotic killing that was taking place through um, as, as, as effective as it was in terms of numbers they killed, a nonetheless chaotic killing of the Einsatzgruppe and, and, and then the Reinhard camps. Here again, you can see medical people have just selected uh, this little boy and woman is being signaled to go to the left across the tracks. Uh, people are dispatched to walk now towards the gas chamber as they cross these tracks. Again, you can see clearly this is a doctor with that insignia right there on, on his sleeve. And if you look at this line, um, they're headed towards the gate, towards that gas chamber there. Um, that just gives you a sense of how many people are going to die in that one gassing. If we enhance the photo a little bit, um, we can see that it's mostly children and elderly. The photographer actually um, pursues the line and, and stops people taking photographs of them on their way to die. There's a series of these photographs. These were found by a survivor in a concentration camp on the floor in an album. And um, she recognized some of the people in those photographs as uh, coming from her uh, village. Um, she gave um, family members of survivors photos. She tore some of the photos out of the album. Um, others she brought with her eventually. Um, I think in, in, she settled in Florida and um, historians eventually came across her album and, and um, it was acquired, I think, by the Yad Vashem, which is the um, Holocaust, uh, um, Holocaust Museum in Israel, acquired the album and the album figured as well in evidence against um, Auschwitz guards under uh, on trial in Frankfurt, Germany in the 1960s. Um, there were a number of trials held now by West Germany. Uh, and, and, and so these photographs, the ones that you hadn't given out, survived. These people will be dead within half an hour of this photograph having been taken of them. Here you can actually see a, a group of people uh, stopped in front of crematorium three on the other side of the tracks. And, and you can see people's belongings kind of piled up there. And of course, the attic here is, is where uh, the Zonder commandos would live who worked in the crematorium complex. Here's a, a three-dimensional um, cutaway. Uh, 
uh, as I said, people would enter into um, the so-called undressing chamber, and then they would be walked into the gas chamber here. Uh, Zyklon B would be poured down these vents. There would be kind of a um, metal graded column. Uh, and, and, and so the pellets are, are poured down there um, as people are tightly packed, the body heat of um, thousands of people packed into this tight gas chamber uh, begins to kind of melt the pellets and they release a cyanide gas. The bodies then are extracted by Zonder commandos. Their teeth are extracted, their hair shaven. The Nazis as well shave hair that they use uh, for wigs and, and they use the hair as well to produce um, kind of silent slippers for submarine crews um, because kind of hard shoes, uh, you know, sonar can detect as well and listening devices on um, anti-submarine vessels can detect detect the slightest noise coming perhaps from a submarine and so um, you know a slight bump or, or a footstep in a submarine can be detected so so submarine crews or human hair slippers to um, kind of prevent this the sound and and there were all sorts of other um, reasons the gold again from teeth was uh, melted down and exported and and then the bodies would be loaded up um, on an elevator, a cargo elevator, and then they'd be brought up. There was a um, trough of, uh, sh a shallow trough of water, and the bodies would then be floated down this trough and lifted up into these multiple uh, ovens. As I say, people would be ordered to undress in that chamber and um, you know, told that they will recover their property afterwards, after the shower. And of course, nothing of the sort would happen. And, and, and they essentially sorted their own clothing for its eventual recycling. Uh, here is the only photograph we have. This again was taken by the construction firm that was building the crematorium. The only known photograph of the crematorium from the rear with the gas chamber roof. And, and so again, contrary to those um, Holocaust denier accusations that those um, chimneys were airbrushed in, we can actually see the four uh, ventilator chimneys on the crematorium, on the gas chamber roof right there. One, two, three, four. Now, as I say, this is the only known photograph of the gas chamber roof uh, before the Nazis blew it up. Right there. The gas, as I say, Zyklon B would come in these cans. It is produced by a subsidiary of IJ uh, uh, Farben, several subsidiaries, Degesha Corporation is one of them. It comes either in these kinds of crystal um, pellets or in felt, um, felt uh, kind of uh, discs. Um, it's a commercial pesticide. It's intended for disinfecting granaries without um, infecting the grain. Thus, you know, you can kill mice inside a, a, a granary full of grain. Uh, the gas will eventually evaporate, but the grain can uh, be eaten. Um, and, and so it is a commercial uh, product for pest control. Zyklone means cyclone. At one point, um, the SS had asked IG Farben to remove the warning indicator from the gas. Um, there, there was a chemical compound in the gas. It's, it's by the way, cyanide gas. 
Um, there was a, a chemical compound in the gas, uh, in the pellets, that when the gas is released, it makes your eyes burn. Um, it's, it's a warning, essentially, if anybody's exposed to gas, that something is wrong, your eyes begin to burn, you, you choke. And, and, and so the purpose of that is for, to make you run away from the gas. Um, the SS, because it, again, wants to kill, quote, humanely, it doesn't want people um, screaming and suffering in the gas chamber. And so they asked um, IG Farben to remove the warning indicator, and RG Farben refused uh, on the basis that a cyanide as a natural uh, compound is not patentable. And so the only thing that um, has patent protection in um, Zyklone gas was the warning indicator chemistry. Uh, and, and so IG Farben argued with the SS that if we remove the warning indicator, we risk uh, endangering our patent, our exclusive patent on this gas. And, and so it took um, essentially um, a higher Fuhrer order and Himmler to intervene with IG Farben and have them produce a special um, line of, of Zyklone uh, B gas without the warning indicator in it. There's a color photograph of, of what these blue pellets uh, look like. We have um, lots of plans and blueprints for um, these gas chambers and, and crematoria. Um, again, a Holocaust uh, deniers um, deny essentially the existence of these uh, gas chambers or uh, that they were, you know, some say, yeah, they existed, but they were um, used as a morgue or that uh, these chambers below were disinfection chambers and, and so forth. Um, the issue partly is, is as we look at um, the blueprints of these um facilities as they survived and were kept by the Auschwitz uh, Museum. And again, while Poland was behind the Iron Curtain, very few Western academics were given access to these original documents. And, and, and so that whole Holocaust denial of the gas chambers um, took really deep root until these uh, blueprints were released. And in fact, ironically, um, it's a Holocaust denier from France, Jacques Prissac, who um, in the 1960s actually infiltrates the archives of the Auschwitz Museum in an effort to prove that the gas chambers did not exist and discovers for himself that they did in fact exist. And he publishes many of these um, blueprints and in fact becomes um, the world authority on uh, the operation and function of these gas chambers, um, ironically. And so now these are in the public domain. And what we do discover, essentially, what we learn as historians, that indeed um, the gas chambers at Auschwitz um, were improvised in the sense that we begin to see how blueprints begin to change over uh, time, that these were uh, going to be corpse um, cellars where they store bodies. Of course, um, you know, with, with um, nearly a quarter of a million inmates, um, you know, uh, over a hundred thousand inmates is of uh, under you know deprived conditions many are dying they build these crematoriums um, you know there's a fear of course of typhus um, Auschwitz doctors German doctors uh, several of them died having contracted typhus uh, 
um, in the camps, uh, guards uh, contracted typhus. So the worry of um, the guards and the German administration that they, that they may catch a disease from prisoners, um, you know, and, and so many are dying, they wanted to quickly cremate these bodies. So these crematoria are, are built, but gradually as they're building them, we begin to see a number of changes taking place um, as evident by blueprints and blueprint revisions. Um, for example, um, at first we see that there are uh, ramps leading down to the basement, that the bodies are going to be um, slid into the basement. Uh, the ramp is then gradually replaced by a staircase. And so we realize now that the dead are going to be walking on their own down the staircase into the um, uh, undressing room. We also um, notice that um, the direction that the doors will open and close is, is changed is changed and altered. Specifically, you can see that um, almost all the doors open inward into our room, except uh, the doors where the gas chambers are located, those open outwards. And, and of course, it means that if you have 2,000 people inside who are now dead, there will be many dead bodies piled up against the door. And so if you try to open the door inwards, uh, the bodies would prevent, of course, the door from opening. Thus, this need um, to open the door outwards. We, we see um, the installation of a cargo elevator, I say, as I said, the removal of um, the uh, ramp and its replacement with stairs. So all these changes have been tracked and, and we begin to understand how gradually what started out as a crematoria being built as the camp is being expanded, eventually are quickly converted when the time comes to these large scale uh, homicidal gas chambers. The crematoriums are interconnected, so um, or the ovens, so one oven kind of heats the next, there's kind of a circular flow. Um, the company that built these crematoriums has maintained the patent on them, and in fact, I, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the crematorium, a crematorium in Winnipeg uses that same uh, patent today. This is um, what the crematorium and gas chamber looks like today. You can see where the stairs were right here. This is taken from the guard tower overlooking crematorium uh, two. You can see this is where the stairs were, where inmates would have been walked in, the victims, and then you can see the gas chamber would have been there. So all that's recovered at the end of the war, this is what the Russians find when they walk into um, the camp. The, the um, ovens, as I say, were dismantled, the ventilation system dismantled, and then the buildings were blown up by the Nazis prior to their um, evacuating out of the camp. That's in January of 1945. This is what the ovens look like above. And again, multiple ovens. You're, you're talking, as I say, um, minimum of being able to kill and dispose of 2,000 bodies every 90 minutes. So uh more more or less the whole process it's a kind of an assembly line process zonder commandos would process these bodies as they say um the the teeth and hair were already cut in a, a room below in the basement prior to them being loaded into the ovens And again, at the end of the war, the Allies uh, find the storage rooms that the SS kept, um, and they didn't have enough time to melt down the dental gold, um, yet to gold bars, the last phases. And so, and so they find all this dental gold, 
um, extracted from victims' mouths, boxes and boxes of dental bridges, um, gold, uh, wedding rings, all taken from uh, the victims. This gold, as I say, is um, everything is carefully cataloged. The gold is melted down. Um, I, I looked at this in the previous lecture in, in, in more detail, um, but essentially eyeglasses, clothing, clocks, wallets are all um, recycled into the uh, German economy. Um, uh, you know, clothing is distributed to ethnic German uh, resettlers. Uh, the furs are given to Waffen Assessmen serving on the Russian front. Uh, clothing to families of Assessmen. Uh, linen, blankets redistributed to ethnic Germans in the GG, the government general in Russia. Um, the hair is distributed to various corporations. Um, uh, German currency goes into the German budget. Um, uh, um, jewelry is uh, sent through pawn shops in Germany. Some of the precious metal goes to the mint and so forth. Watches, clocks, wallets, pens are um, given to the Gauleiter of Berlin, which is uh, Goebbels, by the way. Watches distributed to SS divisions, glasses and so forth. All this stuff is recycled. Um, the gold, the dental gold, um, as I say, is, is taken by um, the Reichsbank under Walter Funk. And Walter Funk has made this agreement with Reinhard Heydrich to essentially launder for Nazi Germany abroad the dental gold. Walter Funk um, is a former journalist, uh, but he ends up, as I say, uh, chairman of um, the Reichsbank after uh, Schacht is uh, uh, removed. And he ends up at Nuremberg um, and, and he is sentenced, Frank, uh, a life sentence for uh, Funk, here he is. Uh, Walter Funk is, is given a life sentence and then he'll be released uh, due to ill health and he will indeed die shortly after his release. But he, he despite the kind of horrific um, contribution he makes to this killing process, uh, Funk um, is spared the death penalty and I suspect he and several other Nazis, including those in um, IG Farben, are spared the death penalty because of um, what I'm going to describe now as well and, and kind of what they know about, about it, a kind of um, a, a, a um, almost corporate um, globalization that um, occurred through Switzerland. You know, we often associate globalization with the 1990s. In fact, it begins to occur um, during the First World War when uh, corporations find themselves with subsidiaries on both sides of the war and, and realize that they need to offshore many um, uh, transnational, multinational corporations um, to Switzerland, where um, Switzerland always maintains its neutrality, where they can continue doing business during a war in a way that um, neither uh, corporate subsidiary is going to um, be hurt by the loss of um, a war in the country where that corporation is based. So um, everybody profits no matter what with all this banking taking place in, 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 in Switzerland. And so Funk, as this banker, is uh, spared his life, as is Schacht. And again, um, you can look at this from those sources I gave. You can see translation of um, the prosecution document 4045, where Oswald Pohl, the head of the WVHA will, will, will testify um, how, um, you know, Walter Funk and the Reichsbank with regards to jewelry rings, gold teeth, 
foreign exchange and other articles of value from the possessions of people, particularly of Jews who had been killed in the concentration camps, were taken up um, by, uh, he's also the Reich's economics minister, by Walter Funk for distribution in Germany. Um, he also testifies how he was invited for an inspection at the Reichsbank vaults by the vice president, Emil Pohl, and how he himself saw gold bars and other valuable possessions of the Reichsbank. Um, so here we can see this chart of uh, how various property, shoes, textiles, and so forth are distributed in Germany, but um, securities, precious gold, particularly dental gold, is laundered out and smuggled out into the bank for international settlement or settlements in Switzerland, the BIS. And from there, it's a mystery where that gold went and where is it today? The BIS, Bank of International Settlements, uh, is formed in uh, 1930. It's still functioning today. This is its headquarters today in Basel, Switzerland. Um, I don't know what the architect was thinking when you look at, 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 at that bank today, uh, because, uh, you know, damn, if that tower doesn't look like those cooling towers at Auschwitz. The bank, as I say, is still functioning. In fact, here's its website. I, I, I just uh, uh, took a screenshot um, of it this, this, this morning. Um, it's owned by 62 central banks representing countries from around the world. That's today. It's originally formed, you might remember how I described how Germany begins to recover from inflation of the early hyperinflation of the uh, early 1920s through the Dawes plan. And uh, there was as well something called the Young plan where the United States was contributing money so that the Germans can um, repay their war debts to the British and the French so that the French can repay their debts back to the USA. And, and, and of course, I had uh, discussed how these uh, Dawes monies, $2.5 billion in loans to Germany, were uh, done in the form of equity investments in German corporations or in the setting up of American subsidiaries in Germany rather than um, uh, Germans being given directly that money. In fact, that money never really arrives in Germany. What happens is that money is banked in Switzerland by the BIS. And so the BIS becomes kind of this clearinghouse every time um, an American corporate entity uses Dawes money to acquire interest in the German subsidiary, um, that money is shuffled around in Switzerland between American accounts and German accounts and so forth. It never leaves Switzerland. It never goes to Germany. It's, it's, it's just moved around there. So that's the function essentially of the BIS in the 1930s. Uh, but of course, once Hitler takes power, the BIS in Switzerland becomes entirely Nazi controlled as, as, as you saw from the board of directors there. So uh, this revival of, of, of German industry partly has to do is because all this American money now has gone in to equity positions. Almost every German company is partly owned by American investors. And that results in this kind of corporate interlocking of um, American and 
German companies during the war with uh, senior SS officers sometimes on the boards of directors of what are American subsidiaries in Germany. Like, for example, the Ford Motor Company continues building trucks for the German army. Um, ITT continues to function in, in Germany. And as I say, you have senior SS officers who are on the boards of directors. So, for example, the Fokker Wolf aircraft company, the National Citibank in New York and AT&T, uh, American Telephone and Tele Telegraph, big phone company still in the United States, um, own 28% interest in the Fokker Wolf aircraft factory that's shooting down American bombers over Germany, while American companies are making 28% profit uh, on, on the construction of these German fighter planes. So this is from the American archives. This is the investment of US companies in Germany in 1943. This is in the middle of the war. Uh, and, and you can see that the German subsidiary, for example, the Deutsche Amerikanische Petroleum Company uh, is actually a subsidiary of Standard Oil, New Jersey or the Adam Opel company is actually a subsidiary of General uh, Motors. Uh, Woolworths is Woolworths. Uh, you have, for example, Telephone Fabrik, the telephone company. Berlin is actually a subsidiary of the International Telephone and Telegraph Corporation. Um, uh, you know, Kodak, Eastman Kodak, uh, Mercedes, the parent company of Mercedes uh, Bureau Machinen is um, the parent company is Underwood. You might remember them as uh, making uh, typewriters. Deutsche Hollerith Machinen number fifteen is the uh, is IBM International Business Corporations. Kraft Cheese, Kraft Casa Workers, Kraft Cheese Company, uh, Quaker Oats owns Quaker Namital, um, Coca-Cola, for example, had um, interests. Here we go, Coca-Cola. In fact, Coca-Cola has to change its name um, in Nazi Germany. It, it changes its name to Fanta. And, and of course, Fanta is the Nazi drink. Fanta is still uh, on, on sale and so forth and so forth. So um, uh, these companies, as I say, are interlocked. And so uh, the point, if you ever acquire this very rare book by uh, Gianni Tognoli uh, from Cambridge University Press, about central bank cooperation at the BIS between 1930 and 1973, um, we discover that all these gold deposits are, are, are used during the war between September 1st, 39 um, and 1945 to pay interest on BIS investments in Germany. And as well, um, you know, if you're a country, you have to pay for your uh, letters to be moved internationally, uh, railway connections. So postal connections and railway services are paid for with this uh, gold that the Nazis are yanking out of victims' mouths um, and to pay, as I say, um, interest and dividends on investments in Germany during the war. And they're swapping out the gold. The question was, um, the president, by the way, of uh, the bank was an American, McKittrick. Uh, and, and, and of course, he's questioned at the end of the war, um, you know, why did you take this gold? Surely you must have known. And um, McKittrick argues that he could not possibly refuse the gold. He says um, he felt it would be clearly the, uh, clearly to the general advantage that transfers of interest should continue quite apart from they were made in divisional gold. 
after the war, the BIA stressed it had no legal basis to refuse German gold payments and in doing so might have entailed a uh, heavy responsibility for the, um, for the bank towards its own creditors under the Hague agreement, particularly the French and UK governments. German wartime interest payments were its single most important remaining source of income. In the fiscal year 1940-41, interest earned on investments in Germany made up 70% of the BIS's total earnings. So deprived of this income, the bank would have had to stop paying shareholders a dividend from the very beginning of the war. Oh my God, what a tragedy that would have been. So, you know, people die. Uh, their gold teeth are yanked from their um, mouths, their families murdered, uh, but this bank in Switzerland continues to pay dividends to its um, clients and, and customers. And there you have it. Um, that is why Switzerland was never invaded. as um, Marcel von Zeeland in the BIS banking department uh, concluded, he says, it is important for the BIS to show its capability of being of service to its customer central banks, despite the difficult times. The bank is thus acquiring both experience and a reputation that are likely to be of great value at a moment of peace negotiations. So, in conclusion, um, you're looking at um, Raoul Hilberg's calculations of uh, the murder of the Jews, the numbers. Raoul Hilberg is a little bit controversial, uh, and, and I've chosen his numbers because of the controversy. He has um, chosen the lower end estimate, five. 0.1 uh, million, as opposed to kind of the 5.8, 5.9, many other um, Holocaust historians uh, advance closer to 6 million. The traditional is 6 million. Some argue um, that 5.1 kind of is rounded up to 5 million. Somehow psychologically, 5 million sounds like a lot less than 6 million, um, you know, uh, one is too many, but, um, uh, you know, again, as, 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 as Stalin said, um, uh, a thousand dead is a tragedy, a million dead is a statistic. Um, so uh, whether it's five million or six million or, or two million or, or ten or one, um, it's too many. But 5.1 million is Raoul Hilborg's um, lower estimation. He estimates 800,000 uh, people will die in uh, ghettos and general deprivation, privation. Ghettos in German-occupied Eastern Europe, 600,000. Um, Theresienstadt, Theresienstadt is a, a kind of privileged ghetto located in uh, Czechoslovakia where uh, prominent Jews or Jews, wealthy Jews or those with connections were um, kept in uh, better conditions. Sometimes they were kept as hostages and would have been exchanged. And nonetheless, uh, Theresienstadt, 100,000 uh, died there, considering that that was supposed to be a luxury camp. Uh, luxury concentration camps, um, 100,000 uh, in a kind of uh, Transnistria, which is uh, kind of on the Romanian-Russian border. Um, then um, we have the Einsatz group in open-air shootings that I had described, uh, 1.3 million estimated. And, and then Rao Hilberg estimates um, in the camps, 3 million. 
uh, Auschwitz, uh, 1 million, Treblinka, 750,000, Belzec, 550,000, Sobibor, 200,000. Again, um, a slightly lower estimate than uh, the one I had given you, which is the one that's more pre prevalent. As I say, um, Hilberg's, are, are, Hilberg's numbers are on the low end. Uh, you have Kelno, the first place where the gassings took place, uh, 150,000 killed there. And, and then you had another WVHA uh, camp in Lublin, Majdanek, 50,000 there. Um, notice that when you come to the uh, traditional concentration camps like Bergen-Belsen, uh, Buchenwald, Mappaus, and Dachau uh, that we so associate with the Holocaust, actually the death rate the amount of people killed there compared to the other numbers is is minimum 150,000. Um, so so you that's why you have so many survivors of of, of those notorious first generation concentration camps. Um, and and then um, as well another hundred thousand in Romania who had their own kind of death system, and then uh, Croatia about fifty thousand uh, Jews as, as as well killed by uh, the Croats. So altogether um, five thousand one hundred thousand, as they say, on the lower end of the scale. We don't exactly know how many people part of the problem of course is is that the border moved um there was of course the occupation of poland let's say you were a polish jew who escaped to the soviet side um and then moved to um a, a soviet region and then in 1941 the nazis arrive and they kill your family there um do you count as a um a soviet jewish casualty or a Polish Jewish casualty by virtue of being a refugee in the Soviet Union. And, and as I say, borders were moved around, pre-war population, um, wartime population, very hard to estimate exactly. So that's why we're kind of missing roughly six to 700,000 people more or, or, or less. So somewhere between 5.1 and um, 5.9 million uh, people and as they say rounded off um, traditionally and by kind of a consensus of historians to six million to uh, make it an even number. By country uh, we see that Poland um, suffered the most of uh, Jewish casualties three million Polish Jews murdered uh, another 700,000 in the USSR, and again, depending upon where you're putting the borders um, and, and then working its way down. The um, deaths by year, again, um, we can see that between 1933 and 1940, under 100,000 Jews died in what's going to become the final solution. Uh, and then in 1941, with the Einsatz group and killing, you have approximately 1.1 million. And of course, by 1942, the Reinhardt camps operation, uh, Reinhardt is underway. So you have 2.7 million is the highest number in, 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 in the final solution in, in uh, the Holocaust in 1942, and then the numbers begin uh, to peter out, uh, 43, 44, and um, 45. But again, these are the low end estimates. Geographically, in terms of percentage of the population murdered, um, and, and these are not the Hilbert numbers, these are um, again, uh, based on the kind of 6 million um, figure, we begin to see how the Holocaust occurred in different places at different intensities. For example, um, the largest um, systematic killing of uh, Jews actually occurred in Yugoslavia when 95% of the Jews were, were, were murdered. 
Netherlands was under German military occupation. 91% of the Dutch Jews were, were murdered. Uh, and then we can work our way through. We can see that in Germany itself, uh, 33%, a third of the Jews are, 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 are killed. Um, Italy, 14%. And, and then when you get to a place like Denmark, 2% because the Danes, for example, um, resisted in participating in um, the uh, Holocaust. And in fact, when um, the Germans uh, planned to deport Danish Jews, the Danes all organized together and staged this massive evacuation across um, the sea in uh, fishing boats and private boats of uh, the Jews of Denmark were um, evacuated uh, to Sweden by uh, the Danes. Um, in fact, as a protest, the king of Denmark um, uh, pinned a Jewish star to his uniform. And the Danes, in fact, were treated by the Germans as um, Aryans, unlike the Dutch, for example. The Dutch were put under a German military occupation. Denmark uh, was allowed to keep its army. Denmark became kind of incorporated as a um, uh, you know, as a kind of a province, uh, but not exactly into Germany, but kind of as, as a protectorate of, 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 of Germany. And so the Danes were treated very de generously by the Nazis, and, and yet they resisted participating in uh, the final solution. And um, the Bulgarians absolutely refused to participate. No Bulgarian Jews were murdered, although, again, you, you see the notation in um, Macedonia that the Bulgarians um, occupied and uh, Thrasy, which, you know, parts of uh, uh, Greece uh, there, the Bulgarians murdered 11,000 uh, uh, Jews, but um, their own Jews, their own citizens, the Bulgarians steadfastly refused to give up, despite the fact that, you know, um, Eichmann took multiple trips to uh, Bulgaria. Um, the French, on the other hand, happily turned over 25% um, of their Jews were killed, uh, thanks to French population. The Italians dragged their feet. For example, French Jews, um, as Italy occupied parts of southern France, French Jews would escape to safety to Italian uh, areas where even though Italy had anti-Semitic laws and as segregations, the Italians were very lackadaisical enforcing um, racial laws in Italy. Um, a lot of Italian Jews were uh, assimilated into um, uh, Italian society. There were many Italian Jews that supported the rise of Mussolini and the fascist party. And, and so the Italians kind of gave lip service to anti-Semitic um, principles. They introduced various laws, but the Italians did not certainly um, bring Jews to their deaths until um, the Allies begin to fight in Italy and the Italian government uh, falls. And of course, Italy comes under German occupation in 1943 and that seals the fate for um, the 14% of Italian Jews in the North that will be murdered by, by, by the Germans. So um, every country has a, a different history Partly it depends on the local government, partly it depends on the nature of the German occupation. Um, Greece, for example, loses 85% of um, its Jews, again, primarily because Greece is under military occupation. Poland, 80%. Um, the Hungarians, um, the Hungarians resist deporting their Jews until there is a coup d'etat in Hungary in late 44, early 45, and a more right-wing fascist 
uh, faction comes into power in Hungary and, and, and um, sorry, 1944. And, and so in the spring of 1944, this new Hungarian government uh, deports all their uh, Jews. They give them to the, to the Germans. And Eichmann finally gets what, what he wants. Uh, but as I say, the previous Hungarian governments, despite the fact that they were allied with Nazi Germany, sort of uh, resisted. So the final solution essentially was a very fragmented and complex uh, process. It was not as centralized as we often imagined. Um, the Nazis, as I said, had some um, you know, degree of recognition of sovereignty of even um, occupied countries. Uh, as I said, it was Eichmann's primary job to travel to those countries um, as a kind of a um, diplomat of the uh, um, final solution and, and, and try to uh, persuade those countries to essentially surrender their Jews to um, the murder. Um, thus, um, again, this, this kind of um, authoritarian, chaotic system that I've described in ruling Nazi Germany in some ways applied as well to the Holocaust and further fuels this, this notion of um, the chaos of functionalism as opposed to uh, the kind of planned order we imagine um, or that the intentionalists imagine and try to per, uh, persuade um, us as, as having been, um, you know, that there was a kind of a um, systematic centralized uh, planning. It, it was much more decentralized, much more chaotic than, than we imagine. And yet um, underneath that, there is a, a huge bureaucratic process that um, was engaged in not only, of course, identifying the victims, uh, defining them, transporting them, concentrating them into to ghettos and eventually killing them. Uh, there was this, it wasn't a kind of a spontaneous uh, kind of genocidal rage of the kind that we perhaps saw in um, Rwanda in the 1990s over a period of uh, six weeks. Um, this was a slowly nurtured killing environment that was adapted in various different territories and various countries depending upon um, uh, the culture of each country. We saw that, um, you know, some nationals from some countries, some cultures had kind of um, anti-Semitic um, traditions in them as, as, as well. Um, you know, Lithuania, for example, 90% of the Jews are, 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 are murdered there. Um, and, and that partly has to do, again, with local anti-Semitism contributing to to that so so it's a very very complex um, history that of the final solution that concludes this um, these two lectures here supplementary lectures on the final solution and its uh, roots origins and process